the question about false stockpiling. Stockpiling is really just accumulation of forage. In Missouri, we usually fall stockpile, and that's because we have a fairly significant winter. And if we don't stockpile, we'll find ourselves feeding hay or other concentrates just to get through the winter. We stockpile fescue. What we do is we fertilize the field with nitrogen in August and defer the grazing. Stockpiling requires deferred grazing. And we begin grazing typically after the frost. Typically, that'd be something like December. Um, why do we focus on tall fescue? Well, we focus on tall fescue because of the waxy cuticle. That's the first reason. Uh, stockpiling has been attempted with orchard grass and some of the uh, more northern grasses, bluegrass, reed canary grass, that don't have a waxy cuticle. Uh, brome grass doesn't have a lot of uh, fall growth and also does not have that waxy cuticle. So fescue is ideal for this. Fescue also has a long growing season and uh, also fescue is persistent. So that's why, why we do it and it's well adapted to our state. Um, how much nitrogen should be applied and when should we apply it? The when part is fairly straightforward. In fact, all this would be straightforward if we weren't discussing tall fescue. If we were talking about another grass, we'd just have five slides and be done. But you'll see in a minute why we have, uh, why this is a more complex discussion. When do we apply? We apply really around August 15 in Missouri. That's because of our year in and year out uh, killing frost date. Uh, in North Missouri, it could go earlier. In Southern Missouri, it could go a little later, but August 15 is, is a target date, typically for Missouri. How much nitrogen should be applied? Okay, this is where we're talking now about tall fescue and uh, the uniqueness of tall fescue. Tall fescue is not like other grasses and the management is not like other grasses. The animal performance is not like other grasses. Profitability, we don't achieve that like we would with other grasses. The main problem that we have with tall fescue is health and production of animals. About everything you would not want in animal performance you have with Kentucky 31. We're talking mainly about common tall fescue that's infected with the toxic endophyte, which is about 90% of our acres in Missouri. And uh, I've learned over the years to talk about the animal response in terms of health, as if you're speaking with a veterinarian, and production, as if we're talking with a, uh, an animal scientist. And in the health, we have these symptoms, vasoconstriction, fescue foot and lameness, poor thermoregulation, meaning uh, the animals are colder in winter and hotter in the summer. That's why we see so much heat stress. And basically they're sick. Uh, there's an immunosuppression. In terms of production, all of our profitability responses are hurt bad, feed intake, rate of gain, uh, low birth weight, weaning weight, low calving rate, poor milk production. And so when we manage, when we manage uh, Kentucky 31 tall fescue, we don't manage Kentucky 31 tall fescue like we would orchard grass or rye grass or, or and we and that includes fertilization we'll explain why this is a flow chart that we that we use <laughs> this flow chart is used in the fescue belt it came out in 2004 uh, but um, I do a lot of workshops across the southeast and and including the the lower corn belt and this is this is uh, the procedure, this is the thinking that people use to, to manage their fescue pastures. And it begins with testing, and let's just ignore most of this. Let's just assume that we're gonna have a high infected, highly infected field. Uh, that would mean endophyte levels above 60%. And let's just assume we're not going to replace that grass with a novel endophyte, which would solve all these problems. Let's just assume we're gonna continue managing Kentucky 31. The management strategies here, and this will impact our question about rate of nitrogen application. The management strategies include alkaloid management and incremental alleviation. So I wanna cover those just a little bit. In terms of, um, in terms of 
of uh, alkaloid management. What we're looking at here is control points. If we were to replace the field with a novel endophyte, all the alkaloids would be removed simply because we've changed endophytes. We can uh, look at it on a little bit bigger scale and in individual plants to reduce the amount of alkaloids. We have to limit fertilizer. We have to recognize seasonal production and we can do some clipping to remove seed heads. There are all kinds of things we, we can do. Uh, and by, by the way, alkaloid management, really what alkaloid management is, is limiting or reducing as much as feasible the amount of alkaloids that eventually get into the mouth of that animal. So all of these are different control points. So in the plant, in the individual fescue plants, there's some things we can do. In the pasture, uh, we can dilute the pasture with clovers, we can rotate, and that, that has some limitation. And notice how many of these things thus far are spring and summer practices, not fall and winter. So a lot of these uh, dilution, rotation, clipping seed heads, those are not possible in the fall. Uh, the diet is our last control point. That is before we feed it, if it's hay, it could possibly be ammoniated. The diet can be supplemented, but all of these practices will help us reduce the amount of alkaloids available for that animal. Incremental alleviation, I'm sorry I haven't uh, animated this well, but incremental alleviation says this, I can manage my Kentucky 31 pasture, but if I wanna have the same kind of daily gain and same kind of calving and all those responses that I see in a novel endophyte or a non-toxic grass, if I wanna see that kind of production, I'm gonna have to implement multiple practices at the same time and they'll have an additive effect. So in this slide, let's say on the dark red bar, if I have grass only, Kentucky 31 infected only, I might expect my steers to gain a pound a day. Let's say that I add legumes, they'll bump up to 1.2, 1.25 pounds a day, that's their daily gain. In other words, when I add clover, I'm not going from a pound a day up to 1.9. I'm only getting an increment of improvement. With supplementation, assuming it's an affordable rate, I'm gonna get a bump in my animal performance. If I rotate, if I do some other practices. So I have to do all these practices at the same time to achieve some acceptable performance. There is no such thing in tall fescue as a the toxin. There are several, there's a family of toxins. And also in tall fescue, there's no such thing as the solution. There is no the. It's complex and so we do all these things at the same time. So that will help us understand why we manage the way that we do. So if we look at this flow chart and we're down here on the far right, we have highly infected fescue and we want to manage. These are eight practices and there may be nine, possibly 10, but these are the eight that are taught across the Eastern US. And uh, not completely in this order, but somewhat. Dilute the pasture with legumes. We've already covered some of this. Notice number four, limit the nitrogen application. We'll talk about why that is, all right? So here's some things we have to recognize we're getting ready to apply nitrogen for fall stockpile. We need to be aware that fescue and the fall and winter is highly toxic. It used to be said that fescue is toxic in the springtime, and that's where we really got our problems. Well, it is, but a lot of that toxicity in the spring can be managed. It's much more difficult in the fall because of those practices that we just mentioned. Fescue is toxic in the fall and winter. Let's take a look at some of these charts here. Now, I apologize for not citing this, but I think this is Glenn Aiken's work. But this is some of the USDA work in Kentucky. And fescue has a, as we know, fescue yield has what we call a bimodal curve. In other words, we get two thirds of our growth in the spring, then we have a summer period, then we get another one third of our yield, okay? That's what happens there. 
Well, the same is true with toxins. There's a spike in the spring that's affiliated with reproduction. So there's a lot of uh, ergot alkaloid, the toxins that go into the seed head. Then we have this lull and then we see another spike in the fall. And typically in Missouri, we're talking about, I usually say something like Veterans Day because early November we'll see it we'll see it spike. Now that varies year to year. This is the Kentucky uh, data. I'll get the citation for that later. Uh, here is some data from George Garner's group. Uh, and this is esophageal data. In other words, uh, the researchers went in and pulled a sample out of the throat as the animals were grazing and they measured the ergovaline level that those animals were consuming. And notice there's a peak right about that time we're talking about, May to early June, because of the seed heads, then there's this decrease, but look what happens in November. It goes right back up and it goes up just as high. Um, here's another slide. This is from Colin Bach's work, uh, Neil Bailey's work, and Ryan is on the call. Ryan, you butt in any time. I don't remember where this study was done. I thought this study was done at Southwest, but but anyways, you can see here the same thing. This doesn't have the actual uh, calendar days, has the week, but you can see that peak in the spring, the summer lull, and then look at that fall production. The, what we're saying is if you want animal performance on, on toxic tall fescue, the number one concern is manage those alkaloids. All of those devastating uh, traits that we see responses, health and production are caused by these two peaks. So we're gonna do all we can to keep those low because we've got to, you know, we're trying to make money on these animals. We're not just growing a pretty green field. Uh, here's some data from Leanne Curtis, one of Rob's uh, Kallenbach's graduate students. And this field, uh, this study had three levels of endophytes. Uh, this, the highest endophyte level was from a field that had nearly 90%, and then a field uh, in the middle with 51%. And you can see here, this is total ergot alkaloid, it's a different test, but you can see here how toxic this is, beginning in December. Okay, that's right around when people start grazing. Now, sometimes they'll wait. If it's been a good year, of course, wait until January. But look how high that is. Okay, that's twice as high as we consider the minimum for toxic responses. We're in trouble day one, all right? Here is a study that was with the old ARC Plus uh, cultivar, the ARC Plus variety that's not on the market anymore. But anyway, the control plots in this experiment, the control plots were Kentucky 31. So you're looking here at ergovaline levels in the spring and fall from Kentucky 31. This is Arkansas, Fayetteville, which is in the Ozarks, then, then about three hours uh, northeast of Mount Vernon, Missouri. And look at those fall peaks. We need to do what we can. If we don't reduce that peak, we're going to have many, many problems. What makes this complicated is this, that the toxins vary year to year. Typically, people say, what is the number? They want a number. Is it 40 pounds? Is it 70 pounds? What? How much nitrogen should I apply? And um, there is no specific number. I don't know what is the ideal number. I can give you the data that we have and we can make a very good uh, estimate. And discussing the nitrogen rate on toxic call fescue is a little bit like discussing seeding rate. You know, people say, well, you know, when I was at Arkansas, we seeded nine pounds to the acre of, of tall fescue, we got a good stand, but up here the recommendation is 15 pounds. Well, there are some reasons, and there, there's no right and wrong answer. All I can say is there's variation in location when we have seeding rates. Well, the same is true with toxins. Toxins can, can skyrocket some years, then we'll see fescue foot. Uh, I told one of our colleagues the other day, two years ago, I had a report of one of our producers losing 20% of his herd from, because of fescue foot. The year before, I had another phone call where one of our producers lost 20% of his herd. And that's com that comes from these toxins. 
So the toxins vary from year to year. The endophyte level may stay relatively the same, but the toxins change. So let's take a look at that. All of this affects our recommendation for nitrogen rate. Here's a study that was done by Sarah Kenyon. Uh, Sarah's on the call today. Uh, but Sarah was measuring the amount of alkaloids in the vegetative material. In other words, forget the seed head. Okay, it's great to know that the seed heads are toxic, but Bescu doesn't have seed heads most of the year. So where are the toxins? And she found that they were highly concentrated in the lower two inches, at least here at Alton, Missouri. Uh, this was on Tom Roberts' farm in Alton, Missouri. And, uh, but what, what we're looking at right now is look at those first two, look at those first two um, uh, graphs on the top. In October 2012, ergovaline was about 1,700 parts per billion. What is, it, what is typically what we say in Missouri? What is typically a toxic level? It's about 200 or 250. So this is, this is a serious problem, and it would be very serious uh, <coughs> for sheep or for horses, for those animals that actually bite down that low. But go in the next year, and you'll see um, uh, about a 70% reduction. So toxins vary from year to year. Um, here is another study. This is, again, from Colin Bach. This is actually a stockpile study. And we can see ergovaline levels in year one were about 475 part per billion. That's, that's about twice as high as we would want to see for, uh, to avoid fescue foot and calving and milking problems. That's about twice as high. Then the very next year on the same place, it was half that. <clears throat> so this, this uh, affects our ability to just spit out a number. Uh, we know that there is great risk and, it, and it's not just rare. This risk is there every other year. Now let's talk a little bit about this about the reduction of toxins. We talked about alkaloid management. When we're managing tall fescue, we're managing alkaloids. What can be done in the spring that can't be done in the fall? Well, one of them is we can pressure that field either by clipping or by heavy grazing. And this is some of Wendy Rogers' work uh, done up at Lineus where Dave Davis is superintendent. And she pressured that field. This work was also repeated at Georgia and in, and in South Carolina at Clemson. And it's the same thing. If we pressure the field and pressure the field, then we do not have a spring surge in, in toxins. But we can't do anything about the fall. Even if we stay on that field, either by clipping and clipping or heavy grazing, we still are going to have the problem in the fall. Uh, here's a study by uh, David Bolesky. As you can see here, this is a grazed field with low endophyte and high endophyte. Okay, the top, the top one would be uh, Kentucky 31 in our state. And you can see, sure enough, they're able to reduce the toxin load in the spring, but they can't do it in the fall. And we understand the reasons why, because of where the toxins are located. Now, they may, they may be translocated through the plant, but they're, they're located pretty much in the spring, mostly in the seed heads. Um, let's consider this also, that nitrogen increases toxins. And there are just a few of these slides here. Uh, there are probably other studies. Ryan Locke helped me pull this together. But why are we saying this? Because if we remember those eight common practices across the fescue belt, the fourth one mentioned is, is limit the nitrogen fertilizer. We're doing that at the expense of yield because we've got to have animal performance. So nitrogen increases toxins. <clears throat> this is a pot study, but we extrapolated up the uh, application rate per acre, basically 0, 35, and 110. And look at the ergovaline levels in these grasses. With only 35 pounds, we're at 250. We're already at a toxic level, OK? If we go up to 110, we're, we're in trouble. Uh, this is an old study from Missouri. This is George Roddinghouse, who retired. And you can see these different fertilizer rates. And so in the leaf with zero, uh, he had 250 part per billion. I'm rounding this off, 250. You had 60 pounds, he's at 300. Now this is in the spring. This is a spring where there's a lot of growth, or at least in the, I wouldn't say spring, but vegetative stage. 
excuse me, reproductive stage. <clears throat> but if you go above 60, it goes from basically 300 to, to nearly 500. And, and it's worse in these other plant parts, the stem and the sheath and, and the seed head. Look at the seed head, nearly 900 already. And then uh, with the addition of 60, it goes up to 1,000, then 1,500. The point is, and every study will be different, you know, what parts are linear and so on. But all of the studies that, that I have seen have shown that nitrogen increases toxicity. With that, I'll get to the punchline already. What we're gonna say is don't put on too much nitrogen unless you want toxicity. Uh, this is a study, this is one of Rob's studies. Several of us on the phone today were on that study, but this shows that, that even here in, in our own studies in the field, there is a sharp increase in toxin levels uh, when we add nitrogen. Now, for the researchers, they see those confidence limits and they think, well, there's no difference. Well, there is a difference. There is a difference. Total ergot alkaloids as a method has a lot of inherent uh, variability. And usually when you're running a study like this, if you're a researcher, you need about eight reps because of the variability in that lab method. But anyway, that's, that's the technical reason for those confidence limits. But this is a very typical uh, response. If I add nitrogen, I'll see a sharp increase in toxins. Also, don't forget that nitrogen reduces clover. Now, this is bad for a couple of reasons. One is that we want clover in the field to help with our uneven seasonal yield distribution. We want clover in the field because of the calcium and some of the forage quality aspects, but clover is one of the, well, it is the number one practice uh, for reducing fescue toxicosis, adding in particular red and white clover across the, the entire fescue belt. So to reduce that, you know, that's, that's not a great thing. Um, this is a study, it's not a huge reduction except for in year one, and you see here that with 50 pounds of nitrogen, uh, we can see in year one uh, quite, a, quite a reduction, but, but uh, over time that, that, that will reduce that clover percentage. Now let's get to the point that everybody wants to start with. What is the number? I don't know the number. Whatever the number is, it's not the same as it would be on a novel endophyte. If you have novel endophyte, you're good to go. You can put on whatever you want. You're not gonna have animal problems. You'll have a lot of yield in the summer. You, <laughs> it, is, it is a Cadillac forage. But most of us don't have that. We still are, are grazing Kentucky 31. This is a study, also part of the Kallenbach study, that showed these different rates, uh, different yields in response to nitrogen fertilizer. And uh, this is measured by month. And you can see there's a sharp increase. In fact, it really doesn't peak until you're past 100, uh, 100 pounds to the, to the acre. So if we're looking at yield only, you know, and I could afford it and the nitrogen was cheap and so on, maybe I'd go up to 100. I don't know. Uh, here's another study. This one was done on the same farm. This is done at Lenius back when Jim Garrish was here and Jim Brown was alive. Uh, but, but you can see here that the biggest bump from this stockpile study occurred after 40 pounds, at 40 pounds, sorry, zero to 40. And uh, there is, there is a, a, an increase in yield after that. But, but I'll just tell you now, I'll give you my punchline on this, and it's just a judgment call based on data, okay? Based on reams of data and, and many environments. Is I don't like to see uh, nitrogen rates for fall stockpile at 60 to 70 pounds, simply because I want to harvest milk and meat and calves and weaning. I, I need that. And I don't want to lose that. So that's, that is uh, what I like to see. But if you decide that you would rather have yield, and there are some years where you can get away with that. Uh, and the, as you saw the variation in toxicity year to year, well, go ahead. You know, there's, this, is not, this is not like a normal recommendation. This is a recommendation based on animal performance with, uh, with a, an emphasis also on dry matter yield. Okay, so this is a complex 
complex discussion. So here's the conclusion slide for me, and then I'll, I'll ask Eric to weigh in. Eric, I think I got my 25 minutes in here. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yes, nitrogen increases fescue stockpile yield, and, it, and it's pretty pronounced. However, fescue is highly toxic in the fall and winter. This is not just a spring problem. Fescue toxins are hard to control in the fall. I should have added that. They're not so hard to control in the spring because you can clip the seed heads, you can back off on the nitrogen, you can add clover. There are many things that can happen there. A lot of those practices are not available. Now remember, those practices have to be, have to be implemented at the same time because they're additive. And if we, enough of these practices occur and we can avoid fescue foot, we'll probably have acceptable uh, animal performance. It comes at a cost. All those are input costs, but it can be done. Uh, toxins also devastate health and performance. In terms of, of forage livestock problems, not talking just about livestock problems or forage problems, but in terms of a forage livestock problem, fescue toxicosis is the most detrimental problem in the eastern U.S. and certainly in Missouri. So this is, this is serious business, and we have to consider these top points here when we decide how much nitrogen to apply, because point number five, nitrogen increases ergot alkaloids of all types of ergot alkaloids uh, that are in fescue. Also, just as a side point, it's not a huge point, but nitrogen reduces clover. So uh, it's, you know, it's your preference, whatever you want to put on. I don't mean to sound fluffy but the science is not gonna lead you to one answer. It's gonna tell you to be very careful, get the yield you can and reduce the toxins as much as you can so that you're not having all of those, all of those animal problems and profitability problems.